Well, here, here's what I want to do for our last session together. I want to contrast what I think are the only categorical options available to humanity. And I think they fall into two big categories, and it's kind of given away because it's the title of the book that I'm really honored that Jeff gave everybody. That's really cool. The, the categories are this, Jesus or nothing. I'm going to make a statement, and I hope to kind of unpack it a little bit. I can't really do the topic justice here. I teach a worldview class at Boyce, and we kind of take this premise and look at it and contrast it with every worldview. But let me just give you my premise up front. I believe the gospel provides an objective foundation for human flourishing. In fact, I would even insert the word exclusive there, that the gospel provides an exclusive basis for human flourishing, meaning this, that if the gospel's true, we have intrinsic worth and objective values, and if the gospel's not true, we live in a universe that doesn't care, and there's nothing we could do about it. Uh, one of my favorite authors is a British journalist. He was a jolly, plump man named G.K. Chesterton. Every picture of him makes him look like he was grumpy. He always kind of had a scowl on his face, but he was a really happy, friendly, gregarious guy named G.K. Chesterton and uh, was a Christian defender, defended Christian truth. And he wrote an article that was published in 19, or a book published in 1909, a novel actually. And it tells the story of a an atheist who lives on Fleet Street or works on Fleet Street in London, which is kind of like the Wall Street for publishing. In London, Fleet Street was where all the publishers were, all the newspapers were printed, it was where all the big ideas were generated, and there was an atheist there, and he was the editor of a paper, um, of a newspaper called The Atheist. And he had plastered up in the window of his shop one of his most recent publications, and it was making fun of Christians and making fun of God. And so Chesterton starts out with the, the atheist, the editor of his publication, and then he introduces another character who's a conservative Christian who finds his way to London and is walking down Fleet Street and sees the newspaper making fun of God and, you know, um, blasphemous statements, and he breaks through the window, the glass, and jumps onto the, the desk at the editor's office, and he stands up and he cries out, who wrote this blasphemy? And the entire book is about these two gentlemen trying to find somewhere where they can have a duel and fight to the death. But the police keep interrupting them. And so they're taken off to court, and they're told that it's illegal to have a duel and to fight to the death, and so they escape the police, and they keep trying to find somewhere where people will leave them alone so they can kill each other for their differences. And in the end of the book, they both end up in an insane asylum. In Chesterton, what he's trying to portray is that the only two sane people on the planet are locked up in an insane asylum because they understand and recognize what they believe and are willing to defend it. The title of the book is The Ball or the Cross. And what Chesterton meant by that is either the earth points to itself and contains its own meaning, or the earth points beyond itself to a transcendent source. And that's why I say to you today that the categorical options for you and for everyone else are Jesus or nothing. I believe that if the gospel's not true, we live in a universe that doesn't care and there's nothing we could do about it. Wishful thinking won't change it. Holding our Bibles more firmly won't change it. If Christianity is not true, it's of no value at all. But I believe it's true. And so I believe that we have an exclusive foundation for human flourishing. As I said yesterday, the Christian doesn't have to say Jesus has risen and nothing else matters, but Jesus has risen now, everything matters. That all of life has meaning and purpose, intrinsic worth and objective value because the gospel's true. But if the gospel's not true, we just need to come to grips with nothing. We live in a universe that contains its own answers and there's nothing beyond what we could see, touch, smell, and feel to give us meaning or purpose. And I'm convinced that a number of young people who walk away from the faith don't realize the full implications of what they're actually doing. Jesus once was teaching, as he was always doing, but on one occasion, 
he was teaching and he performed miracles and all these people came because they wanted to see the miracles. And then he began to tell them, you know, he gave them bread and he gave them fish and then he made comments like, if you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part in me. And so the people who came for the miracles were leaving because they're like, this guy's nuts. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, will you also leave me? And Peter, who was prone to say, I mean, it's a bit of a crapshoot when Peter talks, right? It could go either way. Probably not the best word choice there. We'll edit that out later. <laughs> but Peter, it could go either way, right? It could be really good. It could be really bad. And, and Jesus turns and says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter says, and I love this, he says, where else will we go? You alone have the words of life. And I'm convinced that many young people don't realize when they walk away from Jesus, they're embracing a worldview that has no objective meaning, no intrinsic worth, that they leave Jesus for nothing. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the first chapter of Colossians. And what I hope to do in our short time together is simply this. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this one thing that I want to point our attention to in Colossians 1, and it's this. I believe the gospel gives a compelling account for the human experience, that the gospel provides an explanation for our existence, that the gospel tells us what it means to be human and why it matters, that it explains it. So instead of dismissing things that are common to the human experience, it actually endows them with meaning and purpose. There's a book out, and anyone in my worldview classes has to read it, because I want them to come to grips with an atheistic worldview. And this, the title of this book is called The Atheist Guide to Reality. It's written by an atheist, as you might assume. His name's Alex Rosenberg. And in it, he says that there's nothing but matter, there's nothing but nature, and he uses the statement again and again in his book, and the statement is this, physics fixes the facts. There was an earlier atheistic philosopher who said something very similar. He said this, he says, what science, Bertrand Russell said, what science cannot teach us, man cannot know. What science cannot teach us, man cannot know. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Did he discover it under a microscope or through a telescope? Did science teach him that? Of course not. It's not a scientific statement. What science cannot teach us, man cannot know, would mean we can't know that statement because science can't teach it to us, right? And so Rosenberg says the same thing. He says physics fixes the facts. There's nothing but the natural world, and if something doesn't have a natural explanation, we have to dismiss it as an illusion. And so by the time he gets through his book, he says the idea that we are actually a person, that there's personality here, is an illusion. You're not a person. There's no self. You are not you. Figure that one out. And when you think about things, we don't have enough time to unpack this, but when you think about things, a rock, for example, can't be about something else right? I mean, you can look up at the stars in the heaven and behold their glory. They will never look down upon you, right? He says that idea of aboutness, that we're about something, is an illusion. We can't be about things any more than a rock can't be about a tree. It's, it's just a rock, and we're just people, and our ideas of aboutness are certainly illusions. And he goes on to say that the idea that we have free will, that we make real decisions, is an illusion, we don't make real decisions. He says the idea that there are, there's morality is an illusion. He uses, to quote him, he says, there are no moral distinctions. Do you want to live in a universe where there are no moral distinctions? Do you want, you want to know what that means? That there's no moral distinction between someone who rapes a child and someone who feeds a child. There are no moral distinctions. See, Rosenberg comes to grips with his own worldview, and like Chesterton's novel, he says it's the ball. It's just the earth, and it contains its own explanations. But I'm convinced that the gospel provides an exclusive foundation for what it means to be human. And if you walk away from the gospel, I'm convinced that the nothing will destroy everything. It will undermine exactly what it means to live the lives we lead with the values we have. And I want to move quickly through my introduction, but I have a few more things I want to say before we get to the text. Tim Keller, well-known pastor in New York, said that, says that there are three reasons people believe or don't believe something. 
He says the first is intellectual. And he actually says it's not just three reasons, it's, it's some measure of each category. So it's not like I'm going to take one and reject two or three, but all three, then in any decision you make, especially important decisions about belief or lack thereof, that three things are influencing him. And the first is intellectual. We've talked about a lot of intellectual reasons this weekend. And the intellect is certainly important. God's called us to love him with all of our heart, mind, strength, and soul. The second reason Tim Keller gives is social. Now, if you've ever heard the idea that you're only a Christian because you were born in America to a Christian family, that's the idea that the social element is the only reason you believe. Of course, that would be true for atheists who grow up in atheist families that they're only atheists because of where they came from. It doesn't prove or disprove things. But you know as well as I do that the social factor is huge. It's bigger than we would imagine. That's why it's so challenging for students to maintain and thrive in their Christianity when they get an environment often when they're surrounded by people who aren't Christians. Sociologists use a big term for this. They call it plausibility structures. We'll get to that a little bit later. So the social, the final, the final element is emotional. Intellectual, social, emotional. Have you ever met someone who likes to brag about the fact that they make emotional decisions? Isn't it usually a negative thing when we say it was an emotional decision? It's usually not talked about. Usually when you ask someone, why are you a Christian? Why are you an atheist? They'll lead with the strongest because of the intellectual reasons. And Keller says, no, no, it's often social and emotional. Well, keep that in mind. Let me give you one more list really quick, and then we're going to jump in the text. There's a guy named Larry Taunton. We actually have him coming to campus to speak um, this summer. He was good friends with Chris Hitchens. Chris Hitchens, the well-known atheist. He did a, a Bible study with Hitch, as his nickname was. They did road trips together. And if you've ever seen a debate with Chris, Chris Hitchens, anybody see a YouTube debate with Chris Hitchens? He debated a lot of people. Often Larry Taunton was the moderator in those debates. He's a well-known Christian apologist. And, and Larry Taunton just had an article published with The Atlantic, a secular um, news outlet. And he gave the observations of spending hours and hours with people who are atheists on secular campuses. And he gave six observations. And for time's sake, I'm just going to hit them really quick. But he met with hundreds and hundreds of teenagers or college students, 20-somethings. And he asked them, tell me, why are you an atheist? And here are his six observations. I'm going to go through them real quick. Everyone he talked to without exception, every student who was now an atheist in a secular student society, an atheistic organization, whatever, it was the Society of Free Thought or Free Will, Free Thinkers, whatever name they might hold to, he said this was universally true of everybody he talked to, that every one of them had a church background. Every one of them had a church background. That doesn't mean there weren't some who didn't, but all the ones he talked to had a church background. Second, everyone who had a church background, which was everyone he talked to, said the mission and message of their churches was vague. That the mission and message of their church was vague. That when they think back to what their church really believed and really taught, it seemed to be vague and ambiguous. Third observation. In the church, they felt like when they raised serious questions, they were only given superficial answers. That's why I love what Sean did yesterday. Because he was responding in a way that you're going to often find. And I think in many times, giving some of the best responses for the atheistic perspective. But these students who walked away from Jesus had felt like their questions were met with superficial answers. Fourth observation, when they did meet a leader, an adult, a caring youth worker, or a youth pastor who knew their Bible and took their Bible seriously, they had respect for them. Even now as atheists, they would talk highly of people who actually understood and believed and took time to teach the Bible. Youth pastors, you should find great joy in this. For too long, youth pastors have wanted to water down the content in order to attract a bigger crowd. And what we've found is we're just sending people to hell who have church experiences, but no real gospel encounter. And when they met somebody who actually knew what they believed and would take the time to teach it, they had high respect for him. One student described his youth pastor at his church, and he said, I love my youth pastor. He took my question seriously. We spent time together. He taught the Bible. And he said, but then the church made a decision. They wanted to grow the youth group, and the youth group hadn't grown numerically. 
And I'm not like four, let's just be small for Jesus, right? So this is not for being lazy. But he said they brought in a younger guy who, who quit teaching the Bible as much. And it started being just about fun and games. And for this one student, he said, it was during that time frame that I stepped away from Christianity. And I lost respect for the message of Jesus. Fifth observation, the ages 14 to 17 were the most decisive years in their college atheism. They didn't come out as an atheist when they were 14 to 17. They came out in college, but they said, if I trace back my decision, it was when I was between the ages of 14 to 17. Leaders, please don't be deceived to think that just because a young person shows up every week and nods their head to your sermon that they don't have deep questions and want someone to spend the time with them and invest in them to help them understand the Bible. Sixth observation, their decision to embrace athe atheism was almost always described in emotional categories. Tim Keller says there's three reasons you believe or don't believe. I would add a couple on there. We don't have time to talk about that. I think he would agree with me, but for the sake of his book, he was doing something different than what I'm doing today. Intellectual, social, and emotional. And they said, when we walked away from the church, it was, they described it in emotional categories. So they left for emotional reasons. And my fear is this. They left the only one who could give them life. And they've embraced a worldview that offers them no foundation. So what does Paul say for us in Colossians chapter 1? Verse 15. He says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Verse 17, he is before all things. I'll say something about that in a moment. And in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Paul describes that in Philippians, doesn't he? That one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There are four words that if you're taking notes, I want you to write down, and I'm going to show you where they're found in this, illustrated in this text, and here they are. The first is creation. The second is separation. The third is incarnation. You can probably see a pattern. I'm a good Southern Baptist. Creation, separation, incarnation, reconciliation. I love that. That's the gospel in a nutshell, is it not? creation, separation, incarnation, and reconciliation. And we're going to see all four things either directly or implied in this passage. The first thing Paul begins with talking about in Colossians chapter 1, one of his central arguments in this chapter is that Jesus is the creator of all things. In fact, if you were to read in Colossians chapter 2 verse 4, Paul gives a thesis statement. Anybody ever have to write a thesis statement? Okay. What's the purpose of a thesis statement? To tell the purpose of your paper, right? You know, you're going to kind of summarize. Paul gives a thesis statement in Colossians 2, 4. He says, I write these things to you. I say these things in order that no one delude, your, delude you with plausible arguments. Well, that's interesting. Paul says, I'm writing this short letter to a group of young believers in a secular setting so that no one could delude their faith with plausible arguments. Do you think we still have that problem today? Our faith being deluded with plausible arguments? And so that's what he says in Colossians 2. And in Colossians 1, before he even gets there, he says, Jesus made everything. He's the creator of all things. It's the same thing John does in the prologue of his gospel. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus is the creator of all things, and here's the key thing. The point of creation passages in the Bible is one central point. There may be other things we learn, but there's one big point. He owns it all. 
That's the point of Genesis. God owns everything. Look what he says in Colossians 1 in verse 18. In the latter part of the verse, he says, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Now, I'm not trying to open a can of worms about creation debates and that kind of thing, but don't miss the point. The point of Genesis 1 is that God owns everything. Abraham Kuyper, the theologian, said this, there is not one square inch of the human experience over which Christ, the sovereign Lord, does not cry out, mine. It's all his. Think about Job, the the earliest book. It's not given in the beginning, but it was considered to be written before even Genesis. Job lost everything, right? I mean, hide your kids, hide your cars. Job lost everything. And what did God tell him? Job, like the only thing he didn't lose is his wife. And his wife's going, curse God and die. If I were Job, I'd be like, why didn't you take her? I mean, like, he's got nothing. And she's sitting there going, you just need to curse God and die. And so Job finally gets up the stamina and finally cultivates enough of a a critical spirit that he has a, a charge to give against God. And you wonder what God says to him? He says, gird yourself like a man. That's what it says in Job. Man up. And you can read it in Job. He goes in this big account. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? God created everything, and he owns everything. That means that there's not one square inch of your life over which Christ is not saying, that's mine. That means to assume our own autonomy is tyranny against the holy God who created everything and owns everything and sustains everything. And when we sin, we are saying, this is mine. And Christ is declaring There's a cosmic call throughout the universe of a sovereign Lord saying, it's not yours, it's mine. Your body's not your own. You were bought with a price. It's his. As we know in Genesis and as we see in Romans, that the greatest tyranny is to deny the creator and worship the creation. So the gospel gives an account of creation, of where we came from. And science continues to point to this one fact for those, I believe, who have eyes to see will see it. I love the discovery of background radiation by Arno Penzias. If you've ever seen seen CSI, you know when someone shoots a gun and there's like the after spray, the whatever you call that. I don't know what it's called, but it's what's all over their sleeve. They're like, I didn't shoot nobody. They take out that little scanner and they like scan their arm. It's like all the spray. I didn't do it, you know, and they're like this evidence right in front of them. Arno Penzias, when the universe, when God spoke, and you had that explosive creation event and everything came into being, scientists have said for a long time that there should be this background radiation that's left over from that explosive event. And Arno Penzias discovered it. Won a Nobel Prize for his discovery. In fact, if you've ever been watching TV, and probably only the adults have ever experienced this, there was a time when cable programming only went to midnight, and then the TV was gone. Well, the the program was gone, right? Your TV didn't, like, mysteriously disappear, but, like, it would just go, (laughs) has anybody ever seen that? Okay, theoretical physicists suggest that one, I love this, one to 10% of that is caused by the background radiation left over from the explosive event when God created everything. That the interference caused by the background radiation is causing 1 to 10% of that static. You know what I hear when I hear that? Which the only way to hear it anymore is when I do this, which is kind of annoying. Or if you take the cable out of your TV so you can see it. I hear the glory of God. Arno Penzias said, what I discovered is exactly what I would have predicted to find if I had nothing to go on but the book of Genesis. Prior to that discovery, the common belief among scientists and philosophers was that the universe was fixed and eternal. 
That's why Robert Jastrow, who was a scientist and, and agnostic, he was a scientist for NASA, he wrote in a book called God and the Astronomers, and he asked the central question, why are scientists so emotional over discoveries about the universe having a beginning? He said, I don't get it. He wasn't even a Christian. He talks about Einstein. He said, why is Einstein having an emotional response instead of an intellectual response? These are men of science. He said his, says in his book, he says, for centuries, scientists have been trying to climb, he calls it Mount Ignorance. And they're trying to climb Mount Ignorance to discover whether or not the universe is eternal or whether or not it began at some point in the finite past and they reach the final peak and they pull themselves to the top only to discover a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. Penzi said, this is exactly what I expected to find. Paul says that Jesus is the creator of all things. For the Christian, as Chuck Colson used to say, there's not one square inch of the human experience over which the Christian should not say, this is his. And if you leave a weekend like this and it's only cognitive, you've missed the point. The point is that he owes you. It's not just that we can have impressive answers. It's that God is the sovereign king and he longs to have your life in full submission to him. If you're a believer, then you'll know this to be true by experience. There's not one thing that you will give up for Jesus Christ that you will regret. You will not regret one thing that you give up for Jesus. And you'll regret everything that you hold back. There is not one thing that you hold back that you will not regret. So today, in recognition that all things belong for him, and what's the point? That he might be preeminent over all things, creation. Second thing, separation. That's implied in the text. You know the Genesis account, God created Adam and Eve. Since we're in a seminary, we could talk, we could throw down a little Hebrew, right? So Adam's name in Hebrew, it's real complicated. It's Adam. That's not bad. I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but it's Adam. But it's not just Adam, it's actually Ha-Adam, and the Ha is a definite article, which is the. And Adam literally means man. And the Ha means the, and the Adam means man. His name was the man. Isn't that awesome? So God created him, he's walking around the garden, buck naked, as the appointed king of the garden with God as the ultimate sovereign ruler. God created Eve, but before God created Eve, God told Adam to name all the animals. Without going into a physiological session here, God would see a boy hippopotamus would leave all the other stinky boy hippopotamuses and go off with a girl hippopotamus and they would have a hippopotamus family. And Adam noticed... Adam knows that the giraffe, at some point, the the stinky giraffe guy will leave the other stinky giraffe guys and find a pretty giraffe girl, and they would go off and start a family. And Adam's looking around, and he thought, you know, the hippopotamus is probably, that's probably not my mate. The giraffe probably isn't my mate. And so God put him to sleep and performed the first surgery, took a a rib from his side and created the woman. He woke up and saw Eve, and there they are together, buck naked in the garden that God created, and it was all good, and all they knew was good. In fact, the only tree they couldn't eat from was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can you imagine a world in which we only knew good? From the time they ate from that fruit, our world has been filled with moral confusion, and we take what is good, and we call it evil, and we take what is evil, and we call it good and here they are in the garden in perfect fellowship with God and they decided that God was not the sovereign king over every square inch of the universe and they claimed a small part of it for themselves and we know that the rest of scripture is filled with God coming to make things right you know what should have happened when Adam looked over and saw Eve talking to a snake it's kind of weird he should have walked over and he should have just, uh, no snake talking to my wife. 
get out of my garden. It's not your garden. It's not your wife. Crazy snake. You know, the rest of the Bible is all about God coming to do what Adam should have done in the first place. Creation. Separation. Look at verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. What he's describing there is that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. I don't know if you you may not have noticed, just on Friday there was an article on a um, a news portal called the Huffington Post, and it was an article from the official chaplain to the Colbert Report. If you've ever seen the Colbert Report, you might make some assumptions about what this excerpt and this article would say, but the official chaplain in the Colbert Report said, when you consider the person of Jesus, you have to consider both his humanity and his divinity. And he said, if you mess with his humanity and you make him less than fully man, then it's no longer Jesus we're talking about. And if you mess with his divinity that he's fully God, then you're no longer talking about Jesus. We have to take Jesus on his terms. He's both fully man and fully God. The Colbert Report, and he's giving an orthodox presentation of the fact that God has come to do what Adam should have done in the first place. I love the fact that God gives us the promise to Eve that the serpent would bruise her heel, but that her descendant would crush his head. And here Paul says, it was the Father's good pleasure for the fullness to dwell in Him. Theologians call this, if you want to go home and impress your parents, write this down and just tell them when they ask you, what did you learn? Say, just say, hypostatic union. (laughs) And I know that Adam's name meant the man. Hypostatic union simply means that this verse that God was pleased to visit our creation. He was pleased. It was his good pleasure for Jesus to visit us in the incarnation. Okay, final thing, reconciliation. We could spend so much more time there, but I want to wrap up with this. Verses 20 through 23, four more verses. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile, that means to join two things together, to bring two things that have been severed, that have been separated, to, to bring them back together through him to reconcile. How many things? All things. Why? Because there's not a square inch over which he doesn't cry out mine, and he's coming back for all of it. He's reconciling all things. Now, you could go different directions with that. That would be really bad, and if I have more time, I'd say more about that, but Jesus' incarnation and his atonement accomplished something that's so mind-blowing, that a holy God could be reconciled to a fallen people, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds... Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. God is one day going to present you before the Father and there will be no reproach. None. There won't be some sidebar conversation. But did you know, Seth, blah, blah, blah. There won't be anything like that. Seth's sitting on the front row, so I'm picking on him. Okay, you're not going to get to heaven and stand before the throne of God, and somebody said, here's what I know about Seth. There won't be any reproach. How can God do this? I used to have a picture that when we, at the end of time, there will be a big, a giant movie screen And we'll stand there before the screen, and I know we'll give an account, and so I'm not saying that we will not be tried for our works, but here it says that he will present us blameless, without reproach. In Jude, it says that Jesus delights in presenting us before God the Father. I used to have an image that everybody would be sitting around munching on popcorn, and then God would be like, okay, and here's Dan DeWitt's life. And it would be replayed for everybody to see, every sin, every 
thought, all the shame, all the guilt. That's not in the Bible. We need to kick that idea and that picture out of the church because Jesus will delight to present us before God the Father blameless. Why? Because we'll be clothed in him. If there was a big screen, there would be one thing on it. It would be Jesus. It's either all of grace or not at all. You're not going to get to heaven and God pull you aside and say, hey, I want you to know something. You see everybody else here? They're all here because of grace, but you, you, you're the exception. You are pretty good. Jesus will reconcile us to the Father. I love the picture that J.D. Greer gives. I've heard him give before. He said, imagine if you're standing before the Hoover Dam and there's all of a sudden a little pinhole leak and water comes squirting through that little pinhole leak and you're standing there looking up at this vast concrete wall holding back and a flood of water and you think, well, that's not good. Another pinhole leak, and another, and then a a fracture, and then the whole wall gives way. And you're looking up at this flood that is going to sweep you away. You will be dead upon impact. J.D. Greer says, imagine if, as that water's coming before you, a hole opens up on the ground. And every drop is sucked down the hole. And you're not even hit. By the after spray, my friends, that is what Jesus has done for us in the gospel. He has taken on the full wrath of God. And if you are found in him, there's not a single drop that will touch you. He will present us holy and blameless. He will reconcile us to God the Father. Final verse, verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Let me just say a couple things and close with a a story about a very close family member of mine and what the Lord's done in their life. You know, there are a few different options about where the universe came from. We've talked about some of them this weekend. I'll give you three real quick. One is a view called panspermia. Don't tell your parents that one. It sounds bad. Panspermia is the view that, that the design that's in the universe could be placed there by highly evolved extraterrestrial life, i.e. (laughs) E.T., Um, aliens. And it's the idea that they either directly or indirectly infuse design into our planet. And there are several scientists who said that's a plausible description for where the universe came from. Another popular option is called the multiverse. The multiverse is an idea, first of all, let me just tell you, you want to know how much evidence we have for panspermia? Zero. The second is called multiverse. How many of you have heard of the multiverse? Yeah, several. It's becoming more and more common. And I I get it all the time, even in an email from a friend this week. He says, well, the multiverse seems to be a very plausible explanation for where the universe came from. The idea of the multiverse is that we're not the only universe, that there's actually an infinite number of orderly random universes. There's just universes after universes, and through a cosmic process of evolutionary processes, they kind of burp out different universes, and the ones that have some good traits will pass on better traits. And and in the end, it's not that uncommon to have a universe that gets burped out that can sustain a planet that allows for human life. Okay, that probably is not the strongest presentation of multiverse, but that does kind of generalize. You want to know how much... How much scientific evidence we have for the multiverse? We can't see beyond our own universe. You want to know how much evidence we have that there's a, a, an, an infinite number of orderly random universes beyond our universe? Zero. We have zero evidence. And people would say, but that's plausible. The third is one that Sean talked about. It's called The Universe Coming Out of Nothing. There's a really famous guy named Lawrence Krauss who wrote a book 
recently, The Universe from Nothing. And there's an atheist philosopher named David Alberts at Columbia University who said, I only have three problems with the book. The first problem is when he talks about nothing, it's really something. It's a minor problem. But you know, a universe from something isn't that provocative, right? You're not going to be a bestseller selling a book, a universe from something. We would all go, yeah. The second critique, he says, not only is nothing really something, in fact, Lawrence Krauss even says when he describes nothing, it's a bubbling brew of virtual particles. Well, why didn't you just write a universe from a bubbling brew of virtual particles? The second critique, that Lawrence Krauss never tells where the laws that guide the nothing came from. In fact, he says in the book, we have to assume them. So the title of his book should be A Universe from Something that's guided by intelligent laws that we don't know where they came from either. It's getting to be a long book title. And David Alberts, this atheist philosopher, says, you know, but my biggest concern with this book is it presents itself as scientific theory and it's really just an attack on religion. A heavy-handed attack on religion. You mean to tell me someone would use a scientific theory to cloak an agenda to undermine the creator of the universe who's crying out, this is mine. Why would we do that? We want autonomy at all costs. And in the end, we find we lose the foundations of what it means to be human. I'll close with this story. My uncle, um, I have relatives in Upper Peninsula, Michigan. I love it up there. It's beautiful. I go fishing with my uncle. They're all mostly Italians. It's my mom's side of the family. The Scapolettis, the Terzaghis. We eat some good food. Really good food. And my uncle's always been a skeptic. His name's Kevin. And I remember fishing for walleye off of his boat on Lake Michigami. And my uncle asked me, he said, Danny, do you really believe a fish swallowed a guy for like three days? And then threw him back up onto dry land. I was only, had only been a Christian for a year or two. I was 16 or 17. And I remember saying to my uncle Kevin, Kevin, I believe that God spoke. He just spoke. And the whole universe came into being. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? No, you wouldn't. You would be dead. Okay, you wouldn't. But God spoke and the universe came forth. And now the heavens are declaring his grandeur. So for a fish to swallow a guy pales in comparison. As you would imagine, he was not very impressed. He was not nearly as persuasive as Sean McDowell was. That was the best I knew to do. If God created it all, then he can tell any fish to go anywhere he wants it to go and do whatever he wants it to do because there's not a single square inch over all the universe over which he doesn't cry out mine. Well, my mom is one of the greatest evangelists I know. And I've seen my mom share the gospel with my friends, with family members, with strangers, and it's just awesome to see. My mom sent my aunt, my aunt's name is Tony. You don't mess with Aunt Tony. (laughs) <laughs> just trust me. And, but she's a great, godly woman. And um, my mom sent my Aunt Tony, but she is tough. Okay, don't mess around with Aunt Tony. And my mom sent her a book called Letters from a Skeptic. And it's from a pastor who had, wrote an exchange of letters with his atheist dad. And the, the author of that book, I have some serious problems with some of his theology, but for the sake of this illustration, God used that book in a powerful way. And my aunt started reading that book. And her and my uncle would go on these long drives across Upper Peninsula, Michigan. And uh, my aunt would be reading it. And she would find something interesting and say, oh, that's interesting. And my uncle would say, well, what's interesting? And she would share. And he said, you know what? Just read the book out loud. I want to hear it. My mom's been sharing the gospel with him for like 30 years. A true convinced skeptic. Just read it. So she would begin by reading letters from the author's atheist dad, and my uncle would listen to it, and he would say, that's right. Christians are idiots, or whatever. That's right. I agree with that. And then she would read the responses from his pastor son. My uncle would say things like, huh, I never thought of that before. 
She would read more letters, and this happened over a long period of time. It wasn't just one trip. Although Upper Peninsula, Michigan, you could probably knock out the whole book in one trip if you were going to go from one side to the other. But um, finally, it gets to a point where the atheist dad says, you know, son, I'm convinced that it makes more sense to believe in God than it does to believe that God doesn't exist, that God makes better sense out of the human experience. And he said, son, I'm convinced that a long exchange about the resurrection. He said, I'm convinced that the Bible is trustworthy and I'm convinced that there's good historical proof for believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this dad asked his son, and I'm paraphrasing, but in essence, son, what must I do to be saved? My aunt read that letter and my uncle responded the same way. And he's now a born again believer and faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel gives a compelling explanation for what it means to be human. And if you walk away from it, you walk away from everything to embrace nothing. It's Jesus or nothing. Jesus once said, and I'll close with this, what would it profit the, a, a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Let us render unto God what is his. And that's everything.